Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about platforms and partnerships. I only have 10 minutes, so I have to explain in 10 minutes what my wife doesn't understand after being nine years in the business, so I'll do my best. Uh, firstly, some things about myself. I'm 32. I'm from the Belgian coast. I have a couple of bachelors. I've worked in the insurance industry over nine years, always on non-life and claims management, and we've been nominated for multiple prizes in the last couple of years. For example, this year we were nominated as uh, the most promising smart uh, SME uh, company in Flanders. Now, this is not my normal uh, presentation, so I, I went online. And in fact, if you look at ecosystems, partnerships, platforms, you find a lot of interesting information. But the final conclusion is always the same. Huh? These eco platforms, these ecosystems are the future for the modern insurer. If they want to go beyond insurance, if they want to move forward or they want to be obsolete, they have to take into account these ecosystems. Now, I've, like I said, I've been online and I read a, the first thing I read was a report about KPMG from 2020 that they said that over 2017, only 180 partnerships with ecosystems and insurers have, been, have started. They have been mostly related to four topics, risk rating technology, data automation, the policy sales, and everything that has to do with claims. Almost 70% of all insurers acknowledge the fact that they have to work with platforms and set up these smart partnerships, but only in practice 32 of these insurance companies already do something in that space. And the main reasons to work with those ecosystems are because of the strict regulations, the legacy systems, and the data mining, but also the focus. We see a lot of insurance companies that have a specific focus on B2C, B2B2C, or whatever, and they need those ecosystems to have a bigger client connection uh, going forward. I also went into discussion, well, not in discussion, I had a quick phone call with a, a tier one insurer in Belgium, and I asked the reason why they want to work with ecosystems and what they want to achieve with those partnerships. And in fact, the, the, the result was they want to uh, broaden the relationship with its customers and evolve into an insurer that actively responds to customer needs. They want to build those ecosystems, but this was an insurance company that doesn't, didn't want to do it themselves, because building an ecosystem, building a platform sounds easy, but in practice, it's not that. It's not the case. So they were looking at Intratex to do so. Now, looking at Intratex as one, but the integration is two. It has to be a smoothly engagement with third parties. An experience for the customer must be seamless. And insurance, insurance companies were always product-based. Now they need to le le look at platform as a service to offer extra services beyond insurance to their clients. But mostly, they have to take into account that they need to shift in two gears. First, they have to keep the lights on. All of the insurance companies have their main systems, their main frames, their own uh, applications, but th these applications still need to, run, need to run because it's their core business, it's what they do day to day. Secondly, with, with these ecosystems, they want to have a speedboat approach. They want to move fast, they want to go forward. And for that, they need partners like Insurtex. It will enable them in three key factors. It's always the same. They want to cut back costs, they want to improve the customer experience and have an increase in revenue. Like I already said, they also need to switch to a service approach and not as an insurance as a product approach. But how do you start? We've been, with Keypoint, we are working in a partnership throughout our ecosystem with eight insurers in Belgium. And the first point, in fact, now it's stated as four, is the focus. What do they want to achieve? What do they want to do? Which clients do they want to address? Without a, a clear focus, you can, do, you can go in every direction. So they need to set the strategy. Where do they want to go? What do they want to achieve? And they have to take into account that the technology will not save them, but afterwards, the final data insights will have a massive impact on the organization. As well, they do not need to know that the technology only facilitates the strategy. Huh? It's not the end goal. It's a facility to move forward and get there. A third po interesting point is which strategy will they take towards those ecosystem platforms, insurtechs? 
We've seen a lot of things. If you look in Belgium, for example, um, you have AG, AG Insurance, that does most of the things internal or themselves. You have insurance companies that partner up with InsurTechs that set a long-term uh, partnership agreement, or you have insurance companies like, for example, uh, Balwaza Insurance in Belgium, who take a part, um, they acquire a part of an InsurTech in Belgium, like they did with our company uh, two years ago. So that's an important decision to take as well. Do, does an insurance company want to do it themselves? Will they uh, acquire a company 100%? or a part of that company, or will they partner up on a long-term uh, sales or a partnership agreement? And this point sounds stupid, it's logical, but without APIs, it's not possible. And in Belgium, we see that there's a big bottleneck in that case, especially because of the legacy systems in place. We see a lot of mergers and acquisitions in the insurance space leading to or resulting into insurance companies with over 100 uh, applications. So these APIs are mandatory moving forward. Now, the components and setting up an ecosystem for, again, focus. It's all about focus. If you shoot in every direction, it's not that simple. They must identify the desti final destinations that support their target customers. Like I said, if an insurance goes B2B, for example, they want to attack the Sandic market. The Sandic market also has their own applications if this, the application of the insurance company does not link with their core market, then the ecosystem will fail. The commercial terms differ. You have theory, you have practice. How do you put it into place? If you set out an ecosystem, is it white label to the insurance company? Do you partner up with the insurtech? How do you put it forward and which the speedboat approach is one? But the practice is that the speedboat takes a long, a couple of years to get there. So they have to take into account, they have to be uh, reasonable, rational in going forward. And third, the level of, engage of the engagement of the clients. You can have set up the best ecosystem, the best platform, but if your cl client doesn't connect, he doesn't, uses it, he doesn't use it, then there is no uh, practice going forward. An existing case that I, for myself, because I'm in non-life claims uh, space, uh, that I do, uh, do find very interesting, is uh, Fixico. I think uh, the most of you guys know, uh, know Fixico. And for me, I, f I read an article two days ago uh, about their strategy in, the, in the, the eco platform. And in fact, in six sentences, they quoted, an ecosystem is a collection of services and channels working together to provide a seamless user experience. It brings operations together around a common goal and enables them to interact through a central platform. For me, that was the, the most relevant quote that I found uh, looking online. Now, what does Fixico do? They put, in fact, car body shops together. They have a platform that overlooks all these body shops and looks at their key performance indicators. Which one is a good quality car body shop? Does he have a good client satisfaction? What's his average cost? And they link that up into the insurance company. The insurance company in Belgium, we have, as you know, the Erkende Hersteller, the Erkende Carrossier. Well, in fact, Fixico looks for the creation of the, that ecosystem, the quality repair network, because insurance companies need, in fact, the car body shop to be performant, have good results, etc. And in fact, Fixico, with a digital repair ma management platform, they integrate all parties. Insurance company, broker or agent, the car body shop, the client, everybody knows the status of the claim of the repair, resulting into uh, a lowering repair cost by 29%, a cycle times improved by 33%, and a high driver satisfaction. For me, this is a huge example of an ecosystem that insurance companies can use on their own way. For Belgium, it's, uh, we have a typical broker's market. I see I have, don't have that much time. And we have Portima Connect, which um, is the main player in the, in the market. So we have Brio as the biggest broker management system in uh, our market and is now working on APIs, which is a great result for moving forward in creating ecosystems in Belgium. What we also see is a lot of legacy, legacy systems, for example, Bawaz taking over FIDEA, taking over Atora, resulting in multiple systems within those insurance companies, and the insurtechs must be able to bridge this gap uh, since incumbents are moving now. Maybe ending with ourselves. Key point, we are active in three years. 
We, in fact, created our own eco platform in the property space, so only property. We work for, uh, for eight insurers, in eight insurance companies, and uh, we have a white-labeled offering. So this is something going beyond insurance. We repair claims for insurance companies and also integrating all parties on the same platform from the broker, the clients, the insurance company. We also integrated with a broker management system, uh, which is called Broker Cloud. So the broker doesn't have any uh, stress in sending claims or having a follow-up towards our, uh, our claims. But we are also linking up with two insurance companies now that the first notification of loss is in fact seamlessly transferred from their application towards ours. So we are getting there to setting up an ecosystem in property, but it takes time to get the speedboat move, moving going. Thank you very much. Thanks. You do, you do get little gifts, so here you go. And you pass on this to the next speaker, Piet Jan van Doren from Rock Estate. He will make the bridge between the partnerships, infrastructure, and the data, and the importance of using data in the insurtext as well. So I'm going to raise the microphones to fit your height, and I leave the stage for you. Go ahead, Piet Jan. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Piet Jan. I am a CEO and co-founder of uh, Rock Estate. Rock Estate is a data science company specialized in helping banks and insurance companies to understand the home of their customer remotely and instantly, uh, instantly where possible. What we do is we give them access to detailed real estate intelligence that uh, insurers or banks can integrate into their processes to build nice customer journeys uh, without making any compromises on risk management. And in the Past couple of years, we have been helping various uh, property insurers with actually reinventing their home insurance. And the purpose of today is to share a couple of insights, experiences, things that we have seen evolve in these past couple of years uh, related to that, and where, of course, data but also infrastructure is playing an important role. Now, infrastructure is when you when you hear about infrastructure at one of these typical events. The, the first thing that you obviously think about is APIs. And obviously, it has been mentioned by Jonathan before, and it is something that we'll be talking about as well. But it is important to remind that infrastructure is something which is way beyond IT systems. And um, it is the backbone of, of any insurance operation, so to say. Now, the distribution model of an insurer will play an important role in how the infrastructure actually looks like and in the legacy that it will create as well afterwards. I mean, direct insurers have always heavily invested in direct channels, which is today, of course, a lot online. Whereas insurance companies, which are more focused on uh, relying on agents or brokers, um, often also rely and have a more of a hybrid approach, where brick and mortar uh, locations still play a crucial role as well in their model. But infrastructure is ultimately nothing more than a means to an end, eh, to sell and manage insurance policies for those customers. And today, I mean, those customers, they expect convenience. For most customers, that basically boils down to having access to an easy-to-understand easy product, which can be purchased and used with a little fraction, and that comes at advantage of competitive rates. But, and digitalization of that is, is of course, a crucial tool, tool towards improving this customer convenience. Um, over five years ago, um, I had to get a new home insurance, and I remember that I had this idea like, okay, let's go, let's, let's go online and let's get my home insurance. And I probably t tried five, six different insurance companies. And ultimately, there was only one insurance company at the time that I tried at least, where I was able to immediately subscribe my insurance policy. And I found that strange at the time. And in the meantime, a couple of months ago, I had the same experience, and it was completely different. I mean, there are no multiple alternatives to actually almost have an end-to-end -end process to transact such, such a home insurance policy. And it shows that things have evolved. And in each different insurance distribution model in Belgium now, there are several examples of how onboarding flows have become much more digital and frictionless for the customer. And this progress would not have been possible without an important evolution of the underlying infrastructure where, of course, APIs are playing an important role. Um, it was mentioned before in the, by Jonathan that, for example, it helps to, to, to optimize processes between and, 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 and lots of different operations. And in our specific case, we helped a lot with um, offering APIs that help the insurance companies to 
uh, do risk assessments based on additional data. Digitalizing the insurance offering is ultimately an exercise in product simplification. Because it's inherent to the business model of an insurance company to look for an edge in the market. I mean, historically, this has led to insurers building products which almost on purpose sometimes look to differentiate themselves and in often subtle but sometimes also significant ways. And let's go back to the home insurance example where um, until very recently uh, and even up to today, most property insurers still apply a system with lots of different questions that have to be actually answered by the customer uh, getting his home insurance. Now, the interesting thing is that those, cu those questions tend to be quite different. And I mean, they aim to get the same information, but they're asked in a different way. And some parties will put more focus on the number of rooms, others will put more focus on the interior. But anyway, it is something that has a certain level of differentiation, which works well, um, as long as the information exchange is really happening within the silo and the walls of that insurance company. And that is, of course, what has happened in the past, um, in, the, in, in, in the past, and that is why insurance companies could get away with its, that level of complexity, so to say, because there was little need for interconnectivity with other systems. That product complexity was likely even most important in, in the business model, the distribution models, where they were still relying on agents or brokers to actually explain more to those customers. But as a result of this, the IT infrastructure has often evolved in hyper-tailor-made configurations as insurers were ultimately not really forced to, um, to really standardize in some sort of way their product offering. And unsurprisingly, these, these, these legacy issues have been very fertile ground in the past couple of years for the wave of innovation that we have seen in the insurance space. Digitalizing a product requires it to be simplified. I mean, any complexity that can be removed from um, any product is something that you should ideally try to remove. Um, and, or if it can't be removed for some type of reason, you should try to put it behind the curtains. And that doesn't mean that the product has to become less sophisticated, but it means that you need to simplify the way that your customer is going to interact with it. And that will have an impact on your infrastructure. And, Many insurtechs have managed, have been very successful at doing this in the past couple of years, um, and have been able to fill the gap where often traditional insurance companies actually fell short. But the good thing is that traditional insurers are also tapping into those new opportunities. And for example, if we go back to the example of home insurance, I mean, the relatively available APIs that are making it possible to quickly access um, data about the property of a customer, for example, have now made it possible to quickly assess a risk while actually keeping the amount of information requested for the customer to an absolute limit. And the underlying process may actually have become more complex, but the perceived complexity of the product by the end customer is usually much lower. Ultimately, a simplified product offering will inevitably lead to more standardization. And by standardization, I do not mean commoditization. I mean, insurance companies will continue, without a doubt, to, to look for ways of differentiating themselves. But more and more will happen out of sight of the customer. Because the end customer will interact with a simplified, digitalized product, which will, in many cases, require a lot less input criteria. Because these insurers can actually uh, rely on new infrastructure, on new MPIs, helping them with, for example, risk assessment. And it will be very interesting to see what the role will be of some recent initiatives in Belgium, such as Independer or Voila. These aggregators or digital brokers, they, they strongly bet on customer convenience. But when you compare different, si different types of home insurance policies, it's a scenario that you like to avoid is a scenario where you work with different insurance risk carriers and they all ask you different inputs. That is something that you want to simplify. You want to get to a situation where you basically ask the same inputs for everyone that you can send actually the same input to the risk carriers and get prices and you don't really care about how those pricings are actually calculated. Um, and the role of APIs will become increasingly important there. 
as more insurance companies are pushing their digitalization efforts, ultimately products will be made simpler for the end customer. And the real difference will have to be made behind the screens. Other side of the customers, which is where the rapidly evolving infrastructure of, insurance, of the insurance ecosystem offer, offering more interconnectivity than ever before will play an increasingly important role. And as a result, it's going to be very interesting to see how that um, evolution is going to lead to a possible conversion of the different insurance distribution models. Thank you. I still have your gift as well, so there you go. Our next speaker is from Microsoft. He's ready to go, taking a last sip, and he's going to make the bridge to another part. Um, I'm looking at my speaker, how to build those platforms, right? And how Microsoft can help you to do that. So there you go. You have the speakers in front of you. And on, yeah, fine, that will all work. Go. So great to be back on a, on a real stage, uh, coming today from, uh, from Paris, uh, meeting with people and still doubting uh, if people uh, still have teeth uh, with masks. But um, anyway, um, uh, I'm, I'm, pl I'm pleased and honored to be uh, part of this session uh, in rainy Brussels today. And you know, rain means cloud. And you know how much uh, we love cloud at uh, Microsoft. So let me um, maybe jump into, um, into the topic and uh, if the clicker works. It works. Uh, and, and first, um, acknowledge that this um, industry is uh, going through a, a massive change, uh, as you can, can see here. And I think um, we see a big trade-off uh, in this industry, which is basically finding the right balance between uh, enabling innovative uh, customer and employee experience with speed and ag agility, while managing the reality of the situation uh, with cost pressure, uh, risks, uh, legacy, and of course, uh, uh, compliance and regulation. You, you see here uh, a couple of these uh, forces that, uh, that drive or accelerate uh, the change uh, in, the, uh, in the industry. Uh, and these are kind of common themes. Uh, I, I won't cover uh, all of them, but think about um, the threat of a disruption or disintermediation with a, uh, I'm not talking about the intratech that are really helping the industry going forward, but think about um, disruptors uh, and company coming from outside the industry. You take Tesla, for example. Uh, that start to offer an end-to-end -end, uh, solution from uh, the landing uh, to the cars and to uh, offering uh, embedded insurance uh, in their offering. So you see that um, things are changing very, very fast. Um, growing data, you know, this is all about uh, data. Uh, data becomes, uh, as we said, a new uh, currency. Uh, you will hear a little bit more uh, about that. But this is the way where we need to think about, hey, who owns the data? Is there, is there a way to monetize data? Uh, how to kind of uh, share this data across the, uh, the ecosystems? And of course, fraud, cybercrime, um, you know, probably accelerated by the, by the pandemic, became a, a very, very hot topic. But more than that, uh, you know, we just went out of uh, COP26, and, and you probably uh, understand that sustainability and all this ESG conversation becomes very, very hot. It's a board conversation. Uh, and of course, related to data. And these are the kind of forces where the industry will have to, uh, to work on and to try to, uh, to impact. And, and impacting uh, is probably uh, uh, find some way to change. Uh, and changing is not the usual thing we do. You know, optimize a little bit here, uh, accelerate a little bit there, automate a little bit uh, elsewhere, uh, because the industry is no more uh, related on tradition. Industry only respects innovation. And when we talk about innovation, uh, it's not about the kind of, uh, hey, let's do it faster. Uh, sometimes you have to think out of the box. You have to think about disruption. I was discussing with a customer about uh, uh, disruptive strategies in the insurance, actually. And he told me, you know, you have two ways to approach um, innovation. Uh, when you have, uh, let's say, uh, uh, headwinds uh, in your business, so stormy weather, you can or try to protect your business by building walls, so bigger walls, more thicky walls, or you kind of think about building windmills. So think about uh, using the, the kind of headwinds to transform it into opportunities. And this is all about innovation, and I think here the, uh, the quote here is uh, absolutely great because this gives you a sense of uh, sometimes think uh, out of the box. The good news is that there are great technology that supports this innovation. 
So AI, artificial intelligence, automated intelligence, augmented intelligence, becomes mainstream. We have a lot of, um, we see a lot of, uh, you know, these kind of themes um, helping to, um, you know, go after fin crime, thinking about what is the next best action, next best offer uh, to look after, you know, how we um, kind of uh, uh, go after churn propensity uh, and bring more intelligent and turning data into insight. Uh, part of um, artificial intelligence is cognitive services. And this is also an area where we start to see very innovative uh, customer uh, application that are really um, you know, making the grade and, and bring a new uh, personalized experience. Uh, having um, conversational bots that can help accelerate, facilitate, empower insurance uh, and insurers to do more and, and to uh, focus more on their, on their customers. The mixed reality is one other uh, kind of a big trend. Uh, and in the insurance, it makes a lot of sense, you know, be able to uh, analyze pictures at real time and to think about here uh, assessing an accident, what is the kind of next thing to do and even evaluate um, what you have to, uh, to do for, uh, for uh, uh, the payment. Big data, yeah, this is the big topic. Uh, you know, we, we sit on a ton of data and the question will be, hey, there is no great AI if you don't have great data. So how do you structure the data? How do you manage the data state? How you kind of uh, look into uh, building something that is really helpful in taking a great decision? IoT, big topic in insurance, and blockchain. You heard this morning about you know, blockchain becoming mainstream and blockchain becoming a, a very interesting case uh, to accelerate digital transformation. And in, in the insurance, we uh, already see uh, some very good uh, use cases. But nothing could kind of scale if we would not have the uh, the cloud, or what we call intelligent cloud. So it's at the core, but also at the edge. And think about these kind of uh, four uh, enablers um, uh, about cloud to uh, accelerate digital transformation and really drive innovation. First, it's a question of economies of scale. You heard that we announced uh, you know, cloud um, operation here in uh, Brussels, so we have a new region, a couple of data centers that will help um, uh, Belgium to uh, digitize faster. But this is where you kind of get the elasticity and you get uh, the innovation closer to you. It's a question of economies of scale. All what we do in terms of innovation is immediately available. So no need for you to kind of develop your own kind of capabilities, just use it. We spend you know, billions of dollars to create this uh, innovation. Uh, in terms of security, $4 billion uh, per year to make sure that this is as secured as possible in the way you uh, consume these uh, operations. It's uh, also a way to uh, bring agility uh, into um, your business, and of course, uh, it supports sustainable finance as this is uh, the next topic and, and, and the big uh, data thing. So when we talk about data, data, as I call here, is natural resources. You know, whatever this data comes from, uh, in terms of engaging with your customers, in terms of um, collecting information from the way your uh, employees are operating, in the way you transform uh, your operation and you create uh, operational efficiency. So think one second about these data being collected uh, and really uh, uh, you know, empowered and, and, and turned into insight. And then think about what we would call a digital feedback loop. So having this data, collecting the data from all uh, over the places uh, and bring, uh, you know, uh, uh, get the telemetry and be able to react at real time by feeding back uh, to your customers, to your employees, uh, you know, optimize your operation and of course, looking into how you transform your, your products. Uh, we also agree that you know, this doesn't happen overnight, uh, you know, implementing a digital feedback loop. So we might think about horizons. Horizon one is where we start to optimize. Uh, this is where we look into how we enhance the current business. And this is a question of you know, how to interconnect. Uh, you know, it's typically uh, the open insurance uh, kind of conversation. Uh, in horizon two, we look into how we can redesign uh, operations. The focus is probably more on the expansion of the business, and this is where we talk about platformization, so offering a platform to enable others um, and to, to achieve more. And finally, when we look into Horizon 3, this is where we start to see how we reimagine uh, any business, and this is the area where the business models evolve, and this is where we start to see the notion of uh, ecosystems. Let me take you maybe through a a couple of examples um, in the different stages. You have here um, four insurances, progressive uh, in, the, um, in the US, uh, very much uh, focused on, on using um, you know, cognitive services. They created the chatbot, uh, and they connected the chatbot to, uh, to Facebook. So Facebook is interacting with customers and creates a new customer experience. 
Hiscox entering into the flood um, insurance. A huge um, you know, amount of data to analyze was just not possible uh, on premise. They use massive uh, risk compute uh, capabilities. They do know what they have been doing uh, over uh, eight months. They do it in eight days. Um, Liverpool, um, Victoria, using uh, here as well uh, AI, machine learning, to kind of look into specific cases and accelerate uh, the, the treatment of these cases. And Munich re reinsurers looking into catastrophic risk. Uh, that is also a pretty uh, hot topic, and this is all about data and machine learning. When we look into uh, the, the platformization, you have here uh, three other uh, cases. Swiss Re creating a digital marketplace for automotive uh, at first to be able to um, operate risk uh, in a much better and faster and more optimized way. Allianz creating uh, a core insurance as a platform and as a service and offering that to their internal um, um, uh, operation, but also to uh, external customers in a white labeled way. And AXA creating a data health platform to kind of start to link uh, different uh, industries together, which brings me to the, uh, to the conclusion uh, that goes after cross-industry ecosystem. So starting with uh, interconnection, uh, open insurance, going into platformization, and all powered by data, powered by AI, you start to see now uh, operations that go cross uh, industry. And you, for example, connected health, bringing health and insurance together, um, uh, as an example. Connected car, bringing insurance closer to the car manufacturer and offer end-to-end -end stories. So the journey has started. Uh, take care, stay safe. And thank you. Thank you very, very much. We have another panel ahead of us. So I'm going to introduce Patricia. If you want to ask anything about insurance and how tough it is to deliver that, Patricia is your go-to woman, because correct me if I'm wrong, this is your day job at Asuralia now, right? Helping the insurers to make that tough uh, <laughs> bridge uh, across the, the rough waters of innovation and how to get those things delivered that we saw in the three previous talks. Um, I will keep an eye on the room for you, Patricia. If there's any questions and you raise it, I will come to you, ask it, and pass it on. Yes? So, go ahead. So, a very warm welcome from my side. Eh? Of course, I'm uh, FinTech Belgium's uh, InsureTech ambassador. So, uh, you heard it, eh? the theme of this day. It's all about platforms. And we just heard uh, the three major building blocks. Eh? You need, of course, uh, you need the data. But you also need partnerships. And you need to have a very good infrastructure with APIs, eh, preferably. So um, let me just ask you, can you please introduce, of course, yourselves? And then also, what is it for you? Platform, platform strategy, platform vision. Just uh, short, what you think about, because we have platforms in all very different kinds. Maybe here, Werner. Hello. Or is yours? Uh, my name is uh, Bernard Soons. Uh, I'm the general manager of uh, Independent Belgium. And I am here today to represent uh, a broker. Uh, we are specialized in uh, non-life uh, products for the consumer market. And we try to broke in a digital way, but not only in a digital way. We, we, we are a company of flesh and blood. We are people who are working in the customer care. But uh, everywhere we can automize and where we can uh, give more convenience for clients, we will do that. And, and one f of the, the main things we do before we are selling products or we are giving advice is always comparing uh, products, premiums, but of course also the content of a, of a coverage and, and the quality of a policy. That's where we are standing for. That's what, okay, perfect. And maybe now we go to uh, maybe Philippe or Bart, one of the Insurance uh, players, would you um, introduce yourselves, please? Okay. Yes, yes um, I'm Bart van Bergnoot. I work as a senior business architect at uh, KBC Insurance, uh, working on the digital transformation and, and strategy. Um, and our platform vision is, in fact, that we talk about the platform when we go beyond insurance in a, in a multi-partnership model 
Uh, and what is important in that, and what is also challenging, is that it needs to be a valid business model for all parties involved. So everybody has to win, everybody has to have some meat to the bone in uh, such a platform, with the ultimate goal, of course, always to, to bring a frictionless experience to customers, making their life easier. That's, uh, how, that's our platform vision. Okay, Philippe? Well, I don't yeah. know if uh, the micro yeah. is working. So I'm the Chief Information and Technology Officer and AG Insurance, and also in charge of digital uh, enablement, I will say, and data management. So uh, I'm a strong believer in platforms, but basically AG Insurance sees platform two ways. The first way is to make our operation more efficient and to create more convenience for partners and customers, and the second way to extend this platform, to extend the value chain, to make ourselves even better in the proposal and differentiate ourselves even more in what we can offer to our customers. So platforms are very key for an efficiency reason, for a convenience reason to the customers, but also to add value in the insurance chain and to compete better with the other insurance companies. Okay, thanks. Tanguy? Yeah, hello everyone, so I'm Tanguy Bokeh, I'm the co-founder of Seraphin. Um, so when we, Sarafa is an insurance broker in Belgium, we are in a scale up, uh, an insurtech scale up. Um, so the, the two main problems we wanted to tackle with the insurance industry when we launched Sarafa uh, several years ago was first the co complexity due to insurance. We, and it's difficult to, and we, we heard that today, it's difficult to subscribe a contract, it's difficult to know if you're well covered, difficult to know what guarantee you need. This is the first thing. The second thing is lack of trust. And so it's, it's why we decided to, to be um, uh, to be part of the revolution of the insurance, and we, we, we talk to it also every day, uh, th th today is uh, the revolution of simplicity. So thanks to technology at Serafin, uh, we want to, to simplify insurance on the one hand, and on the, ha the other hand, we want to use people and human person, because in short, insurance is about protecting people, and we, we should never forget about that. So what is the, the vision of Serafin about the, about the platformization? Actually, we build, as a insur digital insurance broker, uh, we build um, a marketplace platform where actually all the, the Belgian people can buy all their insurances online. So the car insurance, plat car insurance home insurance, life insurance, health insurance, um, the civil liability insurance. So uh, it, it's a platform where you can buy, where you can manage the contract, where you can uh, get help if you, if, you if, you need, if you need some. I, I, and if you have a claim, you are there to help you and to, to, to be uh, at there at your side. So um, pl the platformization is for us really important and it's why we, we partner with, uh, with some people for, uh, uh, to, to, to get and to attract and to, to touch more clients on the one hand and on the other hand also to, to get a better service uh, when you have a claim because it's, it's really there that the, that the service of a broker is important and we see in Belgium that we 60% of the, of the Market, uh, market share in Belgium is, is a broker. It's, in, it's, it's a special market in Belgium. And mm -hmm. It's why also we, we really believe in the, in the fact that a uh, human person has still this place. Even if it's thanks to technology and digitalization, you can simplify a lot of processes and be really more close to, to the clients. Okay, perfect. Thanks, thank you. Lodo, now your vision more from the B2B uh, atmosphere. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lodo Vermeers. I'm the Chief Information, uh, sorry, Chief Innovation and Strategy Officer of Credendo. I used to be the Chief Information Officer. Um, and as such, I'm also head of Area 42. Um, Area 42 is all about um, B2B solutions in uh, digital trade, um, be it on the payment side, be it on the insurance side, be it on the guarantee side. Um, but it's all B2B, so in contrast to most of my colleagues here, we are not in B2C. We don't have a, a single uh, retail customer. Um, for us, the whole yeah, digital world is, is really native to us. Um, we make a distinction between community, platform, and ecosystem. Um, first of all, um, I think we insurance companies, we, we have to realize that we never offer an end-to-end -end solution. Our solutions are always part of a bigger end-to-end -end transaction that our customers are doing. So as such, we just have to blend in and make sure that we offer the best um, experience uh, possible. Um, and to do that, you have to cooperate. Um, we have a community where we try to gather everyone that is interested in trade, but also in digital solutions or tech. Um, we want to cooperate tighter together with what we call ecosystem partners, 
um, where we typically try to avoid um, competition. And then we want to do that working based on a platform. And so for us, a platform is more the technological basis. And that's what we're focusing on. OK, thanks, uh, Lodo. Um, so let's jump to the first question. Like uh, Tanguy already mentioned, Belgium is kind of a special uh, market uh, situation. And we all see the successes of the platforms. Eh? We have somebody of Independer here in Belgium, but we all know the success of Independer in the Netherlands. Eh? We have uh, WeFox in Germany, we have uh, Lemonade, eh? a bit conquering uh, Europe. So along, eh, according to your point of view, what is, why isn't the, 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 the platforms, why aren't they having a bit more success? Will we get a successful platform in the coming years? in Belgium, maybe start with you, Bernard, because you know the successes uh, in the Netherlands, of course. Okay. Of course, we hope that it will become a, a success, but in Belgium, there are quite a lot of limitations mm -hmm. at this moment. As you know, as told, there is a 60% of the market uh, is, is in the hands of the, the broker business. And there is at this moment still a problem. There is no lack of uh, insert tax. In the contrary, there are a lot of companies you view it there in the hall. There, is, there are a lot of initiatives, though so there is no problem of technology. The problem is on, on two, two, two things. You have the law. It, in Belgium, it's very difficult to switch from an insurance company. There have been a proposition of law in 2019 from Patrick Prevost to reduce the, the switching time to one month. If you say, I want to stop, and then you can change after one month. At this moment, the situation is you only can once a year stop an insurance uh, that's on the experience date, and then you have to, to resign uh, three months before. That's, that's one important uh, limitation. Another one, the most important, is that the, the, the five biggest insurance companies who do their distribution via the broker, that they are, um, let's say, uh, not eager to cooperate. Uh, even they want to cooperate uh, via APIs. Uh, the, the, it was mentioned APIs is needed. They have APIs. I know everybody knows that they have the necessary APIs, but they want to. Op they don't want to open it to G digital brokers. From the moment these digital brokers want to compare in a transparent way, and. That's, that's, that's a pity. It's, uh, I think at this moment, uh, Independent works together with, uh, with the three biggest direct writers. Of course, they want to be transparent and we can cooperate with some smaller companies, but th they have not a, a big, a famous name in the market. But the biggest one, um, they don't want to cooperate. And the reason why it is, is that they are really put under pressure uh, by the, 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 the broker federation. We in Belgium have uh, uh, FAF and, and Febrabel and, and BZB, and they try to uh, to, to 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 suppress uh, the, the bigger uh, insurance companies uh, not to work together because it's better that it's not transparent because prices will will decrease. Of course, that's a consequence consequence, but I'm convinced it's a moral duty of every insurance company that they offer. Uh, a real good pricing in, in a market. Here in Belgium, we did a study, a profound study, in, in comparison with our uh, neighbor countries. We are uh, in, 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 in the mean about between 15 and 20 percent uh, more expensive uh, than the price of, of, of non-life products in, 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 in okay. on surrounding countries. Okay. And that's what we try to, to change. Okay, quite a, quite a statement. Now, uh, we have those uh, insurers also here uh, around the, our table. So can I ask uh, both of you maybe uh, Ed, to give um, maybe your re reaction uh, to that? <laughs> KBC wants me to start first. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> so the, the point on Belgium, I think it's, it's everything is systemic in life. Okay, So there are federations, there are brokers, there are insurers, there are customers. So nobody has the control on everything. Everything is systemic. And if you take the last... 30 years. AG is a complex animal too. Huh? We are very different in function of how we live, how we non life, how we through bank, how we through brokers, how we direct in employee benefit. So there are different animals at AG too. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's one point. Towards the broker, what I can say is that the last 20 years, they 
they barely lost almost no market share in the non-live distribution for retail. So they've been very strong. What we've seen today, it's perhaps a small example, and then I come to the, the insurance part of it, but the, we've seen with the floods we had in the south of Belgium, what we've seen is that not only the guys having problems with their house destroys, but also all the neighbors and all the, 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 the citizens of the, the other villages have contacted their brokers systematically just to make sure that they were correctly insured for that kind of stuff, making sure I'm covered, I'm covered in that case, what happened there, etc., etc. So strongly, we do not believe, but we strongly believe that um, brokers play a role much beyond the price stuff and the selling act. They are, they are extremely present towards their customers. This is something we should not avoid that the truth moment of an insurance company in non-life, and perhaps in life too, but in non-life, it's not when the, you buy the product, huh? it's when you have a claim, because what will be at stake at this moment is from far more important than the selling ad that has taken place perhaps years before. So this is something that we have to, 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 to bear in mind when, when talking about brokers, insurance companies. So brokers play definitely still today in Belgium, a larger role than independent brokers, I mean, than in France, where agents dominate the market. Eh? Agents belong to one insurance company. Netherlands is a very direct-oriented country. UK is an aggregators country, so I can tell you about with my different job, my, di my different, yes, the different job of life. I can explain what happened in this country from my perspective. But Belgium, the brokers, and it's an exception in Europe, still play a huge role in the non-life market. Mm -hmm. That's the first point. And the second point, in, there is a risk in terms of insurance. Sometimes I speak too transparently, huh? so I will apologize to my business colleague afterwards <laughs> because I'm the IT guy. <laughs> but uh, be, um, be basically, I think an insurance do not want to be reduced by a digital broker or an aggregator, an aggregator, even worse than a digital broker, in our sense, to a price. So be because we think that the future of the insurance company is not about price discussion. The future is to extend with all the kind of services that are not directly linked to your insurance product. Uh, you, you, can, you can have this in healthcare. I can take a lot of examples from healthcare, from leasing companies with electric cars, and even battery chargers where we try to, to organize an ecosystem. So of course, I've heard AG wants in general to, con to have some control in the ecosystem. This is true. But we do it in healthcare. We create platforms to connect employees of employers in terms of well-being so that they can spend uh, well-being points they get from their employer on solutions of health or well-being. And we created a platform around all this. This is far beyond the insurance story because we are dominant in healthcare. In, in life, we want also, we have the biggest repair shops in, in Belgium. So the, because we have more than 25% of the insurance in marketing in house market, so we want to extend this and we want also to organize the repair, also repairing kind. So we, we try to push that things much further than a simple discussion of insurance and we don't want to reduce insurance also to a price discussion because we think what is at stake is much more important than the price. Okay. It's a bit okay. of a long response. Huh? Okay, okay. <laughs> Maybe, Bart, I will come back to you later. Maybe first to write at the reaction of uh, Tanguy. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I think what uh, Philippe just said is, is very true because um, I think the price is important, and especially when you're online. Uh, pr price, price comparison is one thing, but actually the, what we believe at Serafin is that the, if, you, if you show too many prices to too many companies to a client, then the client is lost. And what we want to do, we want to make sure insurance is simple for him and that the client can, can easily um, be, be insured. And price sensitivity is one thing, but after um, insurance about protection about people. And, uh, uh, and it's true that we need to, to pay attention to, to the price, but the, the services that you give to the client, and especially uh, uh, when, when there is a claim, or especially in the prevention, because uh, insurance is about protection. So wh what do we do to, to prevent the, the claims and the damage to, to happen? So this is for us something, um, something important. And uh, another point for me, is w why we lack um, uh, some success stories in Belgium is that we, Belgium is a small country and it's true that if you want to become a major a major player you need directly to go to Europe um, and it's for the case for Luco or for Lemonade in, uh, in, the, in the States so it's actors that that, uh, enter, that are becoming very very good in one single product and after that, that goes European but for, uh, for Belgium it's, it's more difficult because we are lacking s like a tech environment uh, with to, to, um, uh, to go for uh, tech partnership that will uh, also facilitate 
the go to market strategy mm -hmm. uh, because as, this is what we see at, at Serafin. We, we have a, a huge number of, of requests for, to, to the clients, but if you want to, to grow even more, we need to, uh, to, to be able to, to partner up with, uh, with other players. And so it will be also important for us. Okay, okay, I understand. Bart? Um, yes, I, I understand the point that, uh, that Philippe made, um, but I would also like to, to broaden a bit the discussion on the platforms because it goes for me much further than, than aggregators. And I think what you see is in the B2B market, there are a number of successful platforms. Uh, uh, I learned uh, about uh, Fixico in the presentation uh, from, from Jonathan, but uh, we also have this, this Informex platform, for example, that, that forms the bridge between insurance carriers, between the, the carrossiers uh, and the people doing expertise. So there are, it's not that there are no platforms in Belgium up and running, and it's not that the, uh, some of them are not successful. In the B2C area, uh, I think the, the main challenge for a platform is, is not necessarily the, the technological side, but it's the, the business model. It's, it's making something that is beneficial for both the customer and for all the partners involved. And that's the, the big challenge. Um, and everybody has its own uh, strategy in that. Uh, we are part of a bank insurance company, so we try to leverage the, the banking mobile channel uh, where we have a lot of uh, frequent touch points with our customers, and that's a leverage from our side. That's probably what we want to bring to the market. Um, and we focus on ecosystems. Uh, I, probably everybody knows we took a joint venture in Emoscope with the purpose of building that as a, a platform that's going to take care of customers in the area of, of the housing market. So uh, everybody has its own uh, strategy in that and is trying to make something that is beneficial to all the people mm -hmm. involved. And I think that's the, if you want a platform to be successful, that's the, the knot you have to tie yeah. <laughs> and make everybody yeah. happy in that partnership. Okay, so yeah, you are referring to the embedded insurance, uh, like the example yeah. uh, we got from Mark uh, this morning, uh, embedded uh, finance. Yeah. But you also mentioned the success of the B2B platform, so Loda, please share your view. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm always a bit surprised about these kind of discussions, whether um, the middleman, because that's in the end what we are talking about here, the, whether the middleman should still be a person or whether it should be software. Um, we are very convinced that it should be a combination. Um, why? Because when you combine data with artifi artificial intelligence with a human interface, then you probably have the strongest way of communicating with your uh, customer. And on top of that, and that is something that, that we definitely see on, on the B2B side, that is you have to look at your customer and be embedded in his main business transactions. Um, and when you do that, then you will be successful. And whether we will do it with something like Independer in the future, yeah, probably yes, why not? Um, whether we will continue with uh, brokers, yes, of course we will. Whether we will work with agents, of course we will. Um, and it's, it's just a mixture and it depends on what your customer wants. Um, and I think I, I understand that you want to standardize, but at the same time, I think the, the strength of an insurance company is to offer solutions to specific situations. And for me, that means go all the way to very ultimate um, yeah, specialization or, or um, how would I say, personalization mm -hmm. rather than standardization. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are certain things that you can standardize and yes, then you, you can cooperate with, with others uh, mm -hmm. better. But in the end, every company tries to show what it's best at and yes, you you have to offer that so that your customer can uh, can use that because in the end it's for the customer that you do it. Yeah, yeah, and that brings us perfectly yeah. to uh, my uh, uh, second question. Eh? You talked about uh, the use of data and use it for uh, personalized eh, offerings. Um, we already heard also the the, the example of, of Tesla this morning. They are offering in Texas already, uh, let's say, uh, real, really personalized uh, car insurance. It's already embedded in the car and it's based on real-time driving behavior. And you pay them on a monthly basis. 
Tesla owns the data. Insurance needs also a lot of data in order to calculate their risk and do the risk as assessment. We have uh, the Apples eh, with the watches, they have a lot of data. We have the Googles, they have a huge pile of data. So my question is to each and one of you, will we have a war for data in the future and who will own the data? And most importantly, will our customers, because we do have uh, GDPR, will they be convinced of the advantages also to use their uh, data and to share them with other parties? So what's your view on that? Maybe we start now at the other side. Philip, maybe you start. So, very direct statement, but you cannot compete with Google or Amazon in terms of getting extracting data from all. They, they are so central today in the world in co with, the, with the persons or companies even sometimes that, that you cannot compete with them. But for the business we are, and for the business we are doing in insurance, don't forget perhaps less in underwriting but more in claims. The number of data we are managing in claims is huge. Huh? When, when we manage claims with, for floats, we have geographical data, we have contractual or contractual data, we have family data, we have, we have photographies, we have, we have all kind of medias that, that we store and can exploit. When, when we have data in healthcare, we have all the bills, very detailed bills from hospitals and what you pay in the different hospitals. So basically in claims, I think today, if you are sufficiently large, you manage a, a, a big, big, big bunch of data to make your product more successful and even the experience of the customer perhaps also better. So this is, don't, don't underestimate what we can manage in claims as an insurance company, but definitely on the front side, this big tech will be there. So for me, these are two debates. Will they become insurance? Of course they could do. Um, one comment I made to myself, when you see all the regulation you have in insurance, huh, the, the capital you need to operate, when you see the GPR story will be for everybody. I'm not sure that kind of company as Google, perhaps if they become insurer, that they will have the return on allocated capital that they usually have in their kind of business. Their return on the capital they allocate is huge huh, if you compare it with an insurance company. And basically, they take almost no risk. So basically, will they enter this? Perhaps, but don't forget they, can also, they have also financial guy on their side that know the capital story and the risk story. So perhaps they will, probably they will progressively, but this is not something that will happen in the three to five coming years or, or very progressively. And one point you said about data for me, which is extremely important, and I want to, to quote this because what, what I'm a strong believer in the data story because in the digital interaction we have with the customer, which is central is data. In the world of the tomorrow, if we um, maximize the, this digital interaction, we'll get more data. If we want to be relevant to the customer, we use more data. So it generates more data, we have to use more data to be relevant to the customers. And all this makes data very central. But having said that, making data central, okay, it's a nice concept, but what you do, do with your system? So we strongly believe that your operational systems of the future, because all big companies, bank insurance, have strong and key operational systems that they will have to share data with their analytics world. Because this future of data, exploding data to be relevant, will we need to get to closer, uh, get to closer, to get, to get analytics and operational intent to get closer and even perhaps share the same data backend. And believe me, in a big company, this is not that obvious, but basically it's the journey we are busy with. So data, Google, yes, don't underestimate us and don't forget that towards the future in terms of insurance company, you have to make your data central and central to analytics and central to operational world. This is a big, uh, for me, one of the big challenge of the future yeah. for insurance companies. So you, you, will, companies. Eh, you are opening up then the data? So uh, I've not said I'm opening the, the, the data. Yeah. I'm placing the data in the data architecture central, mm -hmm. central to the analytics world and central to the operational system so that they can share and reduce distance means perhaps concurrent access, it reduces time to make things available, it means also being able to share algorithms mm -hmm. between the analytics world okay. and the operational world. The, and, and, and all this needs a data, a data backbone which will be central to everything in okay. your company. Okay, okay. Maybe now uh, Bart. Okay. Um, it's uh, very interesting to, to mm. hear it, uh, and, and that's, that aspect is, is quite similar at, at KVC side. 
Uh, what I think is important to note on the data side is that you also have the, the regulatory, let's say, constraints. Uh, on one hand, uh, you have uh, stuff like uh, open insurance, which is about how we should share and, and exchange data and become more open with each other. On the other hand, we have uh, specific laws the, like GDPR that uh, put restrictions and, and require consent on a lot of areas. So that's about what value do you give to the customer in exchange for consent to use data. Uh, and we have certain uh, no-go zones uh, as well, can be uh, European law, but also Belgian law, for example. I also have this watch, mm -hmm. but as an insurer, you are forbidden to mm -hmm. use it for underwriting yep. purposes in health. It's just, mm -hmm. you, we cannot use it. Um, so that's, uh, there are different uh, levels and boundaries there. And an important one, more perhaps from a business perspective, is that what you also see is this, there is a lot more data coming in and a lot more analytical capabilities to process all that data. And in the end, uh, you could evolve to uh, what is sometimes called the segment of one. Hey, you, you, you no longer have big customer segments with a lot of people in it. You, you have one customer and that's your segment level. Uh, what you see there is, uh, you, have a, you have a term, uh, cherry picking. What you have a risk is that this leads to cherry avoiding certain customers. And, and what you then typically see is, if you drive that further and further, at a certain moment, the government steps in and sets up stuff like a tariff bureau and says, well, if no insurer in Belgium wants this segment of the market, then we will take it centrally at the government yes. and we will distribute it across all the insurers again. So there's also a kind of a balance that you need to, to, to keep in how much data and how niche are you going to do because in the end, an insurance, it's about risk transfer, it's the customer appetite, but it's also about risk sharing. It's the pooling of a risk which is important and, and data will get us only so far yeah. until you reach a certain threshold. Yes, of course, of course, the solidarity principle, yeah. uh, that's what uh, insurance is, is built upon. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's for sure. Lode, please. Well, in the B2B world, we don't have to comply with GDPR. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> well, to a certain extent, because in the end, every company is represented by people, so you always have some data about people. Um, but for me, all these discussions, they are more an opportunity rather than, than a problem. Um, and why do I say that? Well, first of all, I, we start from the principle that every company owns the data. We, as an insurer, we will never become the owner of the data. But what we would like to offer is, ah, company, if you are willing to give us some of your data, then we can offer you a service at a certain price. And that service is then beneficial to you. If that is possible, then we can go into business. Um, so we, as a first thing, we, don't, I, we start from the principle, we don't own the data. Mm -hmm. But secondly, um, we insurers, we also have to take care that we are still a mutualizing company. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that we insure all kinds of risks, and for two reasons. One is, if you insure only the risks where you are 100% sure that you will not have a claim, the moment that your customers know that, so they ask you for an insurance, and you say yes, then they will immediately know, ah, that's the moment where I don't need to take an insurance anymore because I'm 100% sure that they only give me an insurance when I don't need it. Yeah, I mean, then you are just ruining your, uh, your, your business. And on top of that, um, I, I still remember in, back in my old days, I was also working for KBC, and one of the KBC agents there said, I was reprimanded because my uh, claims ratio was too low. And that there was a very good reason for that, because you miss a lot of business then. So, yes, you can go extremely far with data, avoiding all kinds of risks, and then you don't need an insurance anymore. Okay, okay, I understand. Tangi? Um, so, it's quite interesting what Tesla has made, but um, I don't think it's a revolution, I think it's rather an evolution, because um, what, what we already see in Belgium or in, in France is um, you, you, there is a small uh, IoT, a small box that you can put in a car, mm -hmm. that makes connected car. 
Um, and uh, it's already making and adapting the price. It's not every month like Tesla, but it's ev once a year. And so if you drive well, then after the, the price decrease. Uh, but that being said, we see and with the clients that, and it's a solution that we can propose with uh, Vivium or with AXA, for instance, but we see that the clients here in Belgium don't want this kind of solution. So it's why we, and why don't, don't, don't they want to have this solution? It's, and it's because we, we we believe that the clients don't want to have like behavioral insurance like that. Because when you have a car, you don't want to be um, uh, tracked about everything you you do, about where you go, about uh, what uh, if you if you uh, slow uh, slow down a bit a bit too much or if you accelerate a bit too high. Uh, people don't don't want, and the clients don't want to be um, to be tracked so high. But in what do we believe? It rather than behavioral insurance, it rather the, the usage-based insurance. So it's it's also using data, but it's it's rather to, to control the person. It's rather to say, okay, we um, uh, if you drive um, le less with your car, then after you pay less. Or if you uh, have you have your home and you you use uh, some uh, IoT uh, elements, and so you, your risk is lower, then you should pay lower. So this is more what what we see and what in what the the, the market we we think will really evaluate in, in the future. Um, and especially because um, this, uh, the, uh, the, the usage page insurance is it's much more future proof and it's what, what we hear from the, from the okay. field, uh, et cetera. Okay, okay. Prima, okay. The last one. <laughs> of course, data is gold. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's clear. We agree that all. And privacy is very important. Mm -hmm. That it's a, a basic principle we agree with. And, uh, but we as a broker, and I want to point that again, we are a broker and we act in, in mm -hmm. uh, for the client's interest. Mm -hmm. uh, we need data in several steps of the life cycle of a contract, of the life cycle of a client we have. And clients hate to, to give data again, data we already have. Uh, you, you know, nowadays have, you have It's Me, you have the EV database, you have several databases of, with all kinds of data. And what we tried, to do is to use all this data again, so in, 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 in the interest of the client, so for the convenience. And um, when we take the client uh, in, if you have a new client, then of course we have to ask a lot of data. We don't have at that moment, but afterwards we are reusing it. And we don't have to ask it again for the convenience of the client. So as a broker, you, you have the intake of a client, that's always a, a moment you're working for him, you are comparing not only prices, but also conditions, uh, let's be clear. But afterwards, you have managed contracts, a uh, client is moving to another place, is buying other car, so you adapt uh, data, and it's the client's decision. He, he has to give consent if we may use the data. If we don't may use the data, then we, 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 we throw it away. That's, that's very clear, following the principles of, of GDPR and, mm -hmm. the, and the main privacy principles. Okay. So, data is gold, yes. Yes, no. okay, okay. And that brings us maybe to the last question of this panel, and because we are almost, uh, we are heading towards our uh, lunch break, we talk uh, uh, data, we think, of course, on uh, open finance, open insurance. Uh, this morning, we all already had the examples of um, the, our banking uh, colleagues. Uh, they already had, of course, the PSD2 legislation. And now Europe is sending us uh, probably other legislation uh, to our countries, more in also opening up the, the uh, insurance uh, industry. So. We also hear about uh, uh, partnerships. We heard uh, somebody of Bellevue say, we are opening up, we are tearing down our fortress, we are uh, uh, collaborating, we are building these ecosystems uh, ourselves. So what do you think, this, this, this collaboration, I think also of maybe agree on a standardized set APIs. We have all these, uh, of course, it's a big uh, challenge, but we also think maybe seize the opportunity and see the possibilities eh, that lay uh, for us there in the future. Maybe now, Bart, maybe you can start. Yeah, for, for me, standardization is, is linked to, uh, if you look at an API, it's about what do you need to satisfy your customers' needs. And there, there is today a, a limit to that. And for me, that, that is linked again to um, 
what is the, the level of risk that a customer feels comfortable with? And, and that has led, indeed, to every insurer in Belgium uh, offering different levels of protection. Uh, the, and for me, it's very clear that the hardest part is to make sure that the customer always uh, completely and fully understands what he is insured for. And I think we saw with the summer floods that this was not always the case. Uh, people were uh, sometimes like, we, we, we don't do that, but apparently some insurers sold policies without the furniture and stuff like that covered. Mm -hmm. And the people apparently didn't know or didn't realize it. And that's something that you absolutely must avoid. And so that, that's for me an important one. You need to make sure that the customer can, can have that. Uh, it must be clear, but he can differentiate his level of protection. And also, I hear a lot about uh, data and APIs, a lot in the sales uh, process, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of focus. And there, for me, it's also the, the underwriting logic remains, let's say, the, the individual choice of the carrier. How do I want to appreciate risks? Uh, so also from that perspective, um, that, that's for me part of the, let's say, the métier of the insurance carrier and something which is very difficult to be standardized. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying it should be always exposed to the customers. Our home insurance takes three parameters from a customer, but um, a lot of uh, a lot of this a lot <laughs> is behind the curtains eh? mm. then so that's that's uh, the the balance you need to make in standardization so there is this commercial playing field there yeah yeah okay okay maybe load them well for us it's it's all about customer experience eh? um, and as I said earlier on I'm truly convinced that um, insurers banks um, even to a certain extent, asset managers, um, they are all part, they all present a few steps in a bigger process for a customer. Um, okay, I'm, I'm not in, in, in housing insurance, but for me, as a, as a private individual, house insurance goes together with buying a house and maintaining a house. That is the important transaction, not the house insurance. Um, when I look at what we are doing in Area 42, for example, we created a new product called Terms of Tech, which provides payment terms to uh, PSPs, so payment service providers. Um, well, what we offer is one, at most, two-click solutions. Why? Because the solution has to be so easy to use that people are willing to do the effort. And I mean, one click is OK, 10 clicks is too much. Um, so it has to be as few clicks as possible and with a significant added value, mm -hmm. namely buy now, pay later. And if that balance is there, then customers are very happy. But at least we in, in Area 42, we are convinced that we never, never, ever will offer an end-to-end -end solution to a customer because that end-to-end -end solution, I just imagine, it's, it's a, a, 3D transaction, a 3D printing transaction between two companies. Yeah, that is what is of importance to those two companies. The fact that we then provide a buy now, pay later solution to that, that's very handy for them and it makes them trust each other. One, two, it makes them transact with each other. Two, but it's never, oh, we want to do this transaction because we want to have that buy now, pay later transaction. No, it's that 3D printing transaction that is of importance. Yeah. And so for us, yes, everything around that, data, uh, platforms, it's all about user experience. And of course, around also partnerships. Eh? If you don't offer the end-to-end, -end, you always need to partner yes. up with multiple parties. And so then one standardized, uh, let's say, uh, APA uh, gateway would... Uh, no. I just convenient, wanted I to suppose. do one sidestep, and that yeah. is because everyone is always saying uh, yeah, data is the new gold. That implies that you see data as a payment tool. For us, it's not. Hmm. Data is an asset owned by the customer. And if the customer wants a solution, he has to pay for it. And yes, we can use his data for that, but it's still his data. We will not use his data to pay for something. To another one, yeah, and that is a very big difference. 
and, and, with the, and with the, with with the, the examples Google, of, of Facebook and so on. Huh? With, with the Google... Uh, of yeah, the Googles, the Facebooks yeah. and so on. Huh? Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. So what what we think about um, collaboration partnerships or, or API or standardization of, mm -hmm. of APIs um, is that we th there is a clear uh, in we have a clear interest in that actually because we when we have a we have a client the the clients would like to to have a, at one one central place all uh, everything which is related to his insurance and today it's difficult for him sometimes he has a credit at the bank so he's a home insurance in the bank he has his two cars uh, at Serafin and, uh, and maybe he has a travel insurance uh, subscribed by cover and uh, so so which means that sometimes it's difficult to to have a clear vision about what insurance you have and what insurance you don't have and it's, it's clear that if you have a, an open finance or open insurance uh, model then it means that we'll be able to 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 dialogue to 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 get to know more about what the clients has and what it doesn't have and would help the clients to be well much more well insure, uh, insured uh, so this is a, a key point for us and um, and of course we, we as, as it has been said but we, it has to create values for everyone and so we it has to be a strategic partnership to 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 to, to create and, and and to to think really what, what is really needed for the clients so uh, the, the customer centricity is key to to have a success in the digital world okay okay Bernard? Yes, of course, APIs are in, in our environment and in eco mm. systems are very, very important. When they become normalized, it should be nice, but in my opinion, it's not really necessary. Uh, we see it nowadays also that a lot of companies uh, don't use, for example, the Telebib 2 normalization. It exists, but it's not always used. So it's not absolutely necessary, but when everybody should use it, it speeds up things. That's mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. Every connection you have to make again goes faster and faster. But of course, the, the, the main thing is uh, all insurance company must open up their APIs. And for, our, for, for us, mm -hmm. for independent, that's the problem that they don't want to set open APIs mm -hmm. uh, uh, for us, not, uh, not all companies. So. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so opening up, okay. Of course. Yeah, Philippe? Well, very, very rapidly, uh, if I summarize the, the question and position of AG, I agree with almost everybody. I, we could say, do we need to regulate more? In insurance is already an extremely regulated industry, industries. And uh, having discussed this with my colleagues in bank, uh, BNP Paribas 40, we are rather close to them. The time it took for the open banking stuff to, to align on banking uh, on account balance it took years huh, before coming to that kind of thing when you see what is on the table of this open insurance story in terms of alignment of data is 10 times more complex so i think it will take decades do we need this to do business and to create partnerships i totally agree we don't need this will it happen i don't know but anyway what i can tell you is that it will probably last for much more than five years because it before it turns to to reality Okay, but uh, sl um, slowly so but surely it will come, you see. I don't know what will happen at European level. I think what is the, the, the intention of the European, uh, I would say, legislator uh, compared to the local industries, but the, the, what is on the table is extremely broad in terms of standardization, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so the, it will take years into account bef before it yeah. comes to a, a, a European stuff. Okay. Uh, looking at the bank experience with uh, open banking. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, so... Shall we end our panel discussion? I think uh, everybody uh, wants to uh, grab uh, something uh, to eat. Very big thanks from my side. It was really, uh, let's say, uh, an uh, eye-opener eh, to have all those uh, different opinions, but uh, I will see a lot of uh, similarities eh, between uh, all parties, uh, and that uh, pleases me tremendously. Many thanks. Lots of gratitude from my side and uh, everybody else, yeah, I wish you a great lunch. Bye-bye.